Politics is all around us during this election year. Despite all of the hype and extensive coverage of major races, our rank and file elected officials remain busy. Stay with us as we talk to two Indiana legislators about crucial issues facing us now and into the future, next on Lakeshore Focus. Programming is supported by NIPSCO. Today's young minds are constantly reimagining what our world will be like tomorrow. That's why NIPSCO is upgrading its infrastructure now, so we're ready for whatever comes next. More information at nipsco.com future. Welcome again to Lakeshore Focus, a weekly show highlighting the key issues, important events, and interesting people in our region. I'm Keith Kirkpatrick. While Illinois struggles to govern itself with an all-year legislative session, Indiana attempts to handle all of our business in a few months. Yet our state-level legislators spend quite a bit of their so-called off time dealing with issues facing us now and laying the groundwork for future actions or sometimes inactions. To help us take a look at what is happening politically in the state of Indiana are two well-recognized and highly respected leaders from each of the major parties. Indiana State Senator Ed Charbonneau, Republican, and Indiana State Representative Charlie Brown, Democrat. Maybe I should clarify that highly respected part by, <laughs> by saying by most. Is that so would you agree to that? Yes. Yes. I'll, I'll buy that. You have a few detractors, right? There are a few. Always. <laughs> so. I thought we would start the show and just kind of talk about some of the political things going on, but I'm always surprised at some of, and I'll just call it, stupid legislation that's sometimes proposed. In all the years you've been doing this, and Charlie, you've been doing it a long time, and Ed, quite a few, what's the stupidest piece of legislation you ever heard proposed? I think uh, one of the, the stupidest was uh, a colleague of mine introduced legislation some years ago that said in the case of the movie theaters they had to put the real starting time of the of the movie as opposed to they allow you that 10 or 15 minutes because they have these promos or talking about uh, th movies that will be coming up in the immediate pa uh, future and boy did it go down in in, in, in with the thunder well, in dessert, to be down in the thunder. Yeah, and I, I don't know if, um, uh, if, if mine would be ultimately stupid, but certainly a head scratcher is uh, when we, in fact, passed legislation designating the uh, sugar cream pie as the, the state pie. And we, we, every year we have uh, a piece of legislation declaring something the state insect or the state this or the state that that uh, don't we have better uh, things to do than this of course uh, certainly certainly do and um, the when, when the, the the sugar cream pie legislation passed it was in the midst of a bunch of other things but really it doesn't take that long a time to do something s simple like that so. but, I, but don't you think that sometimes denigrates the process or at least makes the legislature look a little out of touch or not focused on the right things. But you can, you can appreciate the fact that those legislators that introduced <clears throat> these things, the concept probably from a constituent yeah. or a group of constituents that are sincere about this. Yeah. So there's an feel an obligation to advance that concept. You yeah, know. I, I think that's a very good point that uh, these things don't just pop up for, for no reason at all. It has become or because of a, uh, a constituency of some sort that has come to a legislator and, and that legislator has decided uh, that it's worthy of putting his name on the bill to, uh, to, but, to move forward. But what's the responsibility of the legislator to look at these? I mean, what if I came to you guys and said, hey, you know, I, me and a whole bunch of people feel like every time a dog goes outside, they should wear shoes if it's, if it's raining. You know, I mean, they should wear something on their feet. And I had enough people and brought that to you and said, we have a, have a law in the state of Indiana for this. But most of my colleagues feel obligated to do that. If they get it drafted, you know, they may say, ask, once they see the calendar and where it's assigned, say, you know, I don't necessarily want to have a hearing on that unless you have time. So where's and the courage just to say, 
I don't think that's a good idea, and that's worthy of the well, legislature. I think that kind of thing goes on all the time, Keith. I mean, that, that we're, we're picking examples of thousands of bills that are filed in, in, in hundreds of thousands of ideas that come to legislators, and, and legislators uh, have to use their best judgment in, in determining what they're going to file, what they're going to be serious about, and... Um, and, and the, the process is set up, I find, for the most part, it, it's a very good process that we have in place that, um, that makes it very difficult to pass a bill. And very, keep, very keep, difficult. keep in mind, the average constituent doesn't have a clue as to the process. And so I've they feel that, that this, is, this is very, very important. I mean, they are gung-ho about this particular s subject, yet they, and they may not in, in my district be able to find a dozen other folk that feel that same way, but it is a burning issue for them, and so they feel it should be advanced. Well, we'll, we'll move past the, the yeah, silly we, ones. Yeah, we've kind of <laughs> backed into, I think, a, a good point, though, Keith. Uh, and uh, what, what Representative Brown just talked about, uh, constituents understanding the process. It, it's so important that, uh, that, that everyone understand the process because not understanding the process also, I, I think, eliminates a lot of good ideas that, uh, for, for change that, that could be made from, from getting to the point where it gets studied, it may become a bit, uh, a piece of legislation and get talked about. Well, how much do people really need to know, you know, and the, the people who watch public television are the kind of people who want to know, and I've been down there and spent time with you guys, and it's a complicated process, mm -hmm. and for the average citizen to truly understand, I see the legislators go down, the first thing we ask them is, hey, this is your first year down here, what do you think? They go, oh my gosh, this, there's, yes. this is so complicated, and so how much do we expect a citizen to truly understand? They have, the to, they have to trust those that they put that confidence in by giving us that individual vote. It is kind of unfair, and I, I would use this in my closing. I can use it now. Lakeshore need, and uh, other media need to take more of an interest in educating the folk at this end of the state that have having a clue as to what happens what in, 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 mm -hmm. in Indianapolis. <laughs> they know more about Springfield up here because they can click on the television and see that. Right. But they don't know anything about the committee process, the filing of the bill, the committee process, and getting to the floor for that final vote. Yeah, and I don't even know if they, are, they need to, to know all of that, Keith. I, I think the key is knowing who their state senator is, their state representative is. Good starting and knowing point, right? <laughs> that they can, yeah, they can call and talk to them, uh, get in touch, and that's where 99% of the, the, the legislation starts. I'm still amazed after 34 years in the Indiana General Assembly, some of my constituents still walk up to me and say, why aren't you in Washington today? That is a little disconcerting. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you in this past legislative session, uh, there's a lot of issues going <clears throat> on. Just what do you feel was each one of you picked one issue that you thought we made some significant accomplishment on in this last session? Just one thing that you felt like, I feel pretty good about we move forward on this in Indiana. Even though it doesn't have a direct impact on my district, I hear about it on a regular basis, and that's the methamphetamine and yeah. the negative impact it has on even if it's it's made in a car by these folk or it's in a motel room and somebody else leases that motel room because the the manager was totally unaware that these folk were in there cooking meth the fact that this quote unquote smurfs <laughs> that stop get folk coming off the bus or the train and say, I'll give you this 20 bucks if you go in and buy me this uh, pseudoephedrine or whatever. And it was an interesting subject matter for me, uh, especially when it's mainly a kind of rural issue that the, 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 just the overwhelming impact that me making of meth has on that community and the time that we spent on trying to tie down and not impact the average family or mother that need these medications 
medications that are now behind the counter for their child at 10 or midnight at night and have to go through a whole lot of hoops in order to get it because we have found out that many folk are buying this for illicit purposes. Well, and obviously we need to deal with that. Our state leads in a bad way. Yes. That production of yep. those kind of drugs, so something needed to be done. Yes. So that's a good example where they stepped in, but but a tough balance. So how you prevent that and how you deal with the, the children who need the medicine. Yeah. And I think you, you touch on another good point just then, Keith. Uh, so much of our, our job as we are developing legislation is, is a balancing of uh, interests. And the, I, I think the, the uh, methamphetamine problem that Representative Brown talked about is a key example. And, and one of the ways that uh, was possible to address the issue was to make uh, ephedrine, pseudoephedrine prescription drug. I'm impressed you guys can pronounce these words. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I point to it on yeah. the and, model. And to, to make it more difficult to get the product. But by doing that, we affect every yes. law-abiding Hoosier right. going to make them go to a doctor to get a prescription to buy something that today they can get over the counter. Yeah. Which, I, I, and I think yeah. the, that example of the mother in the middle of the night who's like, I need some medicine yes. for my kid. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to take him to the emergency room. So. Yeah, and I, I think the solution there with, uh, with having the pharmacist play a, a, a very key role in who who can and who can't buy the pseudoephedrine um, is, is very significant. Maybe. They did it as a trial in one county yes. and, it, and the, the problem that they had dropped by almost 50%. Wow. And, and that's because, the, not, not because the, 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 uh, of what was going on in the interview, the fact that the, the questioning was going on, the people didn't even come in that were going to be purchasing it for so, illicit purposes. A success here. So, Ed, what do you see as maybe yeah, what you I, thought we really made some progress yeah, on? I, I think one of, the, one of the big issues, maybe the biggest issue uh, heading into the session and, and successes coming out was road funding. Um, big issue, uh, one of our colleagues, Representative Soliday, uh, who chairs the House uh, Roads and uh, Transportation Committee, was a, 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 a very loud voice about doing something, and, and his proposal ended up not being what ultimately came out, but it, it set the stage for the next two years. And, and I think that it's, it's important that we understand this year was the off year in the off year of, of our two-year budget cycle. Last year, uh, we, we wrote the two-year budget, and generally in, in the short session, uh, which this year was, uh, we, we don't get involved in a lot of the, uh, the kinds of things that are necessary to address long-term road funding issues. But with, with moving things and paying attention, to um, you know, sources of funding, we're able to come up with a billion dollars of new, new road funding mo money over the next two years. Created a task force that is going to be looking at this year uh, how we how we next year address the issue head on the, the for the future. The future. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask this question about <clears throat> this. Always throws me off, and you hear people: the legislature will pass a bill, they'll pass a law. And then you'll hear people say, but they put no money behind it to do anything with it. I mean, how does that happen in our process? How does that happen? That we pass a bill and then really can't implement it. Right. And it, it's left up to the administration to then figure out that we leave and then there's this five-person group that make a lot of decisions, good, bad, or indifferent, the budget committee. Uh, for the not, legislature. Yes, for the legislature and the administration, because it's, it's, it's a combination of a person from the administration and then two persons from each chamber that sits on, on this committee that makes the big decisions about. But don't about, the legislators ask that question as, you're, you've, as you guys are discussing a bill, how are we going to implement this? It's always kick it down the road, you know, we'll, we'll fund it, we'll pass the legislation, but we'll fund it at a later time. And, uh, and maybe, maybe a good example of that is the, uh, the, the legislation was passed this year uh, providing for $7,500 scholarships for 
teachers, uh, I'm sorry, for, for high school students going into college that um, commit to being a teacher, teacher in Indiana for five years. And there's an issue about the funding of that, but we put the process in place so that it can be dra addressed um, next year. Hmm. Well, well, let me ask you again, just kind of looking at the whole process. I know in Indiana, at least there's a group of people who will say, hey, we're doing a lot of things right and we're headed in the right direction. And, you know, if you kind of plot a trend line just of, of the legislation and things we've done in the state over the past five, ten years, where do you think we're headed as a state? What, what do you think the state's going to be in ten years from now based on some of the things we've put in place now that may be good or bad? The biggest issue is the constant elections and we start out with someone, a governor, who is heading in one direction and if he, his party happens to uh, lose and another governor comes in, what happens with all of those steps? Some good, some bad, some indifferent and you, it's like starting all over again. It's like taking four steps forward and then six step back, step backward. I mean, that's a well, part of life. How do you change that? Uh, you, you, I don't know. I, that, that's the $64,000 question. How, how do, if something is happening that obviously every Everyone is happy with, or at least the majority of folk are happy with, but then all of a sudden that's cut off and you're going in another direction. You know, the, 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 the long term, our, our future is, is, is um, uh, dependent upon economic development, job creation, um, education, uh, education. They, they all, all fit into creating an environment in the state of Indiana that's conducive to uh, companies investing their money in Indiana. It's, we're in a truly global economy now, and companies can go any place in the world to make their investment. I think an excellent example is Pratt Industries that uh, recently had a ribbon cutting in Valparaiso. They have invested a half a billion dollars and created uh, somewhere around 500 jobs. And they've done, they chose, they're, they're an uh, international company, they chose Valparaiso, Indiana. And it doesn't happen by accident. It happens because of the work of the legislature, local governments, uh, in, in, in the education system, and in cre creating the environment that that people are going to want, want to work in. Well, let me and, ask about the education one, because that's really an interesting one. What we've done the past 10 years with education in this state, you could plot the line that the decision has been made. And you get to the end of that plotting that line, you've got people who say, if you continue this, we are destroying our education system. It's going to be horrible in the state. And you have this like, it's going to be the best in the nation. How do you resolve that when you're literally looking at the same data, the same information? And you got half the people saying we're going the wrong way and the other half saying yeah. we're going the, absolutely the right way. The, the legislature has to own up to the mistakes that we make sometimes, you know. And a classic example is the I-step. Look how long we've been using the I-step for measuring the youngster. Now all of a sudden, boom. That's cut off. Look at what's happening now with, well, let's not invest so much in char uh, traditional uh, schools and education. Let's give choice to the parents, the individual right to go to a charter school or to accept this voucher and go somewhere. But at the same time, it's kind of eroding uh, already established um, traditional schools that have invested in brick and mortar and a whole lot of other things. And now that that's being eroded because youngsters are able to more mobile and leaving that traditional setting and going elsewhere, but yet these uh, school corporations still have all of this obligation. So, so yeah, would, you, uh, would you say that you're, if you plotted the line, do you think we're going the wrong direction in education? As it relates to charters and vouchers, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. if you look at the line, and, and I am a firm believer in data, in, in data being used to drive decisions that we make. If you look at the line, we're graduating more students than we ever have before. I-step grades are higher than they ever have before. 
and you know we're beginning to uh, invest now in early learning. We, you know, that that's one of the the key things we've done. Pilot programs now, or we're understanding better, um, as everyone else is, that uh, the importance of early learning and. Um, uh, with regard to the charters uh, that uh, Representative Brown talked about, um, there was a need for those. I mean, we, we, in, in the inner cities where, where students were doomed to failure because of, of the systems that were there, and this created an opportunity. Well, let me shift away from education because we're down to the last couple minutes. Uh, if, what do you think that we've done really well that we're, you know, which concerns you the most? You see all these rankings, and we rank low in some things, and we rank high. What one of those rankings that we rank low in really concerns you? Well, um, health care. Yeah, health health care. And, and the, we, we talked about a little bit earlier is the drug problem. We're losing that battle. And, and we need to address it in, I, I think, three, three parts. One is, is early education, uh, another is treatment, and then finally uh, there, there are some folks that are going to need to be put away for a while. We've, we've gotten away from trying to reduce the number of people in prisons, and, and we've just come back because of the drug problem with some mandatory sentences for for, for folks that are creating big problems. So one of, one of the other shows big, the complexity. Other yeah. big problem is what is that line of demarcation for government versus an uh, individual's mm -hmm. rights yeah. and their decision? And I, my best example is non-smoking, uh, something that I championed for years and years. And it took, I mean, we, we went time. halfway there by saying we will not smoke in public places, but we still have some exceptions. And the exceptions are still troubling, you know, uh, the casinos, the bars, and so forth. But it, it takes a long time to get a uh, majority of the legislators to understand this is something that we need to, to get involved in and, and try to say, they, they don't, we pay for it one way or the other. Those persons that smoke, a large percentage of them don't have insurance coverage, so they're going to need health uh, provi provide it to them, and so government pays for that on the back end. All these things are complicated, there's no doubt. We're down to the last minute, so just one real quick thought from each of you. What do you wish citizens knew a little bit or would do a little bit differently to plug into the process? What's that piece of advice for them? Watch what's going on when they have concerns, uh, co contact their, uh, whoever, the, whoever the appropriate government official is, whether it's city, county, state. Which uh, then starts with knowing who yours is, right? Yes. <laughs> That's the yes. one question I ask, whether it's an individual or a group of folk. Do you really know who your legislator is? If not, you should get to know them. So you agree with that, know who that legislator is? Yes. I really appreciate you both being on the show. I know you got a great challenging job down there, and uh, but I think we got some great leadership and appreciate you guys thanks, doing everything you do. Thanks for letting us be with you today, Keith. Right. Thank, Thank you, you very important. much. The description of our current political climate is extremely dark and heavily overcast, prone to become a violent storm without much notice. As I watch the clouds of discontent roll in, my concern is hearing the frequent thunder of the word hate. I hate Bernie, I hate Trump, I hate Hillary, I hate Cruz. This atmosphere alarms me. When did it become this way? I've heard this rhetoric quite a bit during the past few years. It's not just at a national level. I've heard it aimed at state leaders, political parties, and even various local candidates. Beyond the use of the hate phrase, I hear similar attacking comments of, he's an idiot, he's destroying our country, our state, that guy is ruining our lives. I mentioned my observation of this rise of hateful dispositions to our leadership Northwest Indiana class recently. The response from some was, Americans have used the H word and have felt that way since the founding of our republic. Washington was hated by the loyalists. Lincoln hated by the pro-slavery people. FDR disdained for turning the US into a socialist state and Kennedy was rejected because he was Catholic. Through my observations of the past few decades, I truly do not recall hate. 
Hate is a deeply dark emotion. It forms the basis for extreme reactions. It can lead to persecution, discrimination, or rejection. It can generate physical attacks, cruelty, torture, and incarceration. In its ultimate stage, it is executed and exterminated. While some may turn the key, open the gas valve, or pull the trigger, others turn their backs and let it happen because they too hate or are afraid to oppose it. I'm not going to allow myself to be sucked into this churning sea of fear and anger. My faith calls me to rise above it and actually love. Wow, that's tough, particularly when the atmosphere is charged with unrelenting hatred. I can disagree, not share the same belief, or see it differently, but I don't have to hate. Instead, I can advocate for another position, ask tough questions, or challenge someone's words or actions. We must act in more constructive ways and practice civility. If we do not, we may become part of the mob, for the mob acts without reason, in one accord, and becomes destructive. We can always expect more from others, but we cannot control their actions. We can only hold our thoughts, words, and actions to a higher standard. While all this turmoil and strife boils around me, I choose not to hate. Thanks for watching Lakeshore Focus. We always welcome your thoughts and comments about our show. I'm sure some of you would like to respond to what you heard today. You can reach us through our website or the email address listed on your screen. Let us hear from you. Don't forget, you can view past episodes of Lakeshore Focus on our website. Until next week, I'm Keith Kirkpatrick saying, make a positive difference in our world today. Programming is supported by NIPSCO. Today's young minds are constantly reimagining what our world will be like tomorrow. That's why NIPSCO is upgrading its infrastructure now, so we're ready for whatever comes next. More information at nipsco.com slash future.